What's going on? It's Jason Heath, and for years I've been thinking about how to optimally warm up before an orchestra rehearsal or an orchestra performance. I find myself with 20 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe even 30 minutes, depending on the day, on stage with the bass. How do I get dialed in for that performance, and how do I make sure that I'm uh, sharpening the blade, brushing my teeth, musically speaking, to staying in shape without being a nuisance to the other bass players? Well, that's what we're going to cover in this video. The first thing I do when I consider this part of warming up is tuning meticulously, particularly in orchestra, but in general. And I use a digital tuner I clip onto my bridge. I think I use a D'Addario tuner these days, but all sorts of things work. You can use your phone as well. And I just make sure that I'm dialed in perfectly in tune as I'm actually bowing the string. So you may get a different read when the string is ringing. I found my results are best when I am actually tuning the open string and really getting it dialed in. And I've done some videos on intonation, which I will link up to here. Number two, and by the way, I have put all of these exercises into a PDF that you can download in the description below. Open strings are next. So I've tuned my open strings. Now I'm going to do a very simple open string exercise. And this is nothing fancy, folks. It's just open strings. And I am, again, trying to not be obnoxious in my warm up. Uh, if I'm at home, I probably start with a bit more volume if, I, if it's like me and the harp player on stage or one other bass player, particularly if I'm subbing in the San Francisco Symphony or something where I'm a guest. Um, I do not want to be like showboating and being annoying. Uh, I don't anyway. So I generally start off at a pretty low volume, and this is an opportunity for me to just check in with my body and think about my posture and having a nice athletic stance. And I am generally sitting when I'm in the orchestra, sometimes standing, but generally sitting. But regardless of whether I'm sitting or standing, I just use this as an opportunity to scan my body and then do some simple slurs. For me, it's all about the right hand in orchestra, in general. I'll get a little bit more volume going, depending on the context, and really try to get that string vibrating fat. And I'm thinking about my bow hand and staying nice and relaxed throughout. And even if I just have like one minute, uh, hopefully I have more than that, uh, or something really got screwed up on that day, I always do at least that, a meticulous tune and some open strings. And then it's really depending on the concert and the context. I have music in front of me, which we are about to rehearse or perform in an orchestra, so certainly I need to look at that. But if we're doing Mahler's Fifth Symphony, or if we're doing uh, some very simple whole notes, that's going to change my warm up. Uh, if it's a very demanding program, I may just dive right into the music, but generally I try to do a bit of technique just to kind of get me thinking about intonation in general. And I have found that doing just one octave scale, it's very simple, I start with no vibrato and I do this pattern. I found this to be so helpful just for getting warmed up. I'll pluck open strings and I will generally slur into the next note. And I learned this from my bass teacher in college, Michael Hovnanian, like separating the bow change from the note change. It's like you can think about the left hand and the right hand. And I'm just trying to make sure that I'm getting the optimal vibration on every note. I can repeat them as long as I want. I can check harmonics. And then generally when I go down, I do a little vibrato, but I'm not doing like some sort of like old man, nanny goat, or possibly soloist vibrato. If I'm vibrating an orchestra, it's almost always pretty subtle, just a little warming up of the sound. So 
That's something that I find to be helpful in the warm up. And also it just makes me kind of check in with my left arm and if there's any tension in the vibrato, that's probably a sign that something down the chain is tight, maybe my back or my shoulders or something like that. So I find that to be a really helpful way to just check in. And again, depends on the time I have. I will go through all 12 keys, which I've written out in that PDF in that same exact pattern, but I find the most helpful ones to be the keys with a lot of resonant harmonics. So C is pretty good, G is great. And this is just getting me feeling the bass being in tune. Because when I'm in an orchestra section, I'm trying to fit in. I'm not trying to play with a really direct sound, especially when I'm subbing in a professional setting like the San Francisco Symphony. I'm trying to fit in and blend, and as a result, it's a little hard to hear myself in context, but I can feel the bass vibrating, and so just making sure that I am feeling each one of those notes and feeling what good intonation is, how it actually vibrates, and trust but verify, It also gives you a chance to check in with any wolfy notes on your bass and kind of remember how those feel and subtleties like this, like how a wolf feels or how your bass resonates. These, these things make a big difference in a professional context and the weather can change and every day will be a little bit different depending on all sorts of things. How's your rosin feeling? Did it rain last night? And you'd be amazed how much those details really do matter when you get to a really high level of orchestral performance. So this simple one octave scale just just gets me dialed in on the notes I'm actually gonna play on the gig, which is like this part of the bass, the money spot of the bass, for me at least. Uh, I don't need to do three octave scales, with rare exceptions, in the orchestra. And again, I'm not trying to be a showboater, I wanna get called back, and so I don't wanna seem like I'm showing off, which you, you'd be amazed how easy it is to give that impression, at least in my experience. At this point, I'm definitely dipping into what's on the stand, even if it's very simple, just kinda like paging through the music and like getting a feel for something something like that. I will then alternate between these exercises I'm about to do and the music on the gig. And it, it's gonna be very different if I have 30 minutes and it's an easy gig versus I have 17 minutes and there's a lot on the stand. But if I do have the time, I love to do this dominant seventh arpeggio exercise that I modified, I believe, from the Simplified Higher Technique book by Franco Petrocchi. Great book. Let me know if you want me to do a video about that. That'd be a lot of fun. But it's just going through. I start on G. I don't remember if Petrocchi does or not, but I like that. And I just do dominant sevenths. Just two octaves. And I can slur very different ways. And then So now I'm practicing intervals, I'm practicing traveling, I'm getting all the way up to the G harmonic and a bit above even, but in a non-super showy way. And I can do it very slowly for intonation and I can speed it up a bit to get a little velocity in my playing. Uh, and I find that to be just a wonderful exercise. Now this next one I picked up, I believe from Ira Gold, who's a bassist in the National Symphony. And I remember him telling me that he learned it from Albert Laszlo, the wonderful bass teacher. Uh, but I, I've I've never talked to Al Laszlo about it, and I may be remembering this wrong, so if you have more info on this exercise, let me know. But all it is, is a two octave chromatic scale, and I do it with this finger. I start open E, and then I go one, two, four, one, two, four. Now I go to B natural, one, two, four, one, two, four, go to F, and B. Down. So an open E and then everything else is one, two, four, one, two, four. And the symmetry of that pattern is awesome. So you can slur, and I've got these written out in that PDF packet. Uh, but again, you can just figure this out once and you can do it. Um, slurs. Uh, if you do one, twos, threes, fours, sixes, eights, twelves, you'll always come out even. So if I do threes, and 
and it'll and then you can just go back down. So I usually do twos, then I do threes, fours, sixes, eights, twelves if I have the time. And this is now we've done all these diatonic and arpeggiated things, but now we're doing what we do a lot in orchestra, which is these chromatic notes and kind of filling in the gaps. And again, the money zone for me at least, this right up to about the neck block, we're tackling that. And then you can practice this same pattern in a variety of ways off this. I remember, I think, picking up from Ira this really cool, like doing it at the frog, doing it at the tip. And I don't remember why <laughs> this is helpful for your playing, but I do find that it's helpful, and you can try it like in the middle. And then you can just do like off the string, like four times. Uh, three. Two but start up bow. And I find it important, for me at least, uh, to practice spiccato on a daily basis, especially when I'm playing in the orchestra. A, a large percentage of music in orchestra uses that or some variant of that. And so I try to sprinkle that in if I have the time, but maybe I have a whole bunch of spiccato passages I have to practice in the orchestra. That takes priority. This pre-concert, pre-rehearsal warm-up kind of idea is a personal thing, and we've got a great book and video by the wonderful Susan Hagen, who subs a lot in the Boston Symphony. Check that out, and we'll see you in the next one.